people sort of fool themselves uh, of justifying what they see with their visual acuity. The, uh, the overlap of mammal genes that you're talking about um, could come about through common ancestry. So the platypus and kangaroo uh, genomes contain shared genes because they go back to a common ancestor. That is the normal assumption that's made by molecular taxonomists. Yes, but now, once you have lateral transfer, whether it's due to viruses or anything exactly. else, the tree concept of life goes away. And that's what I'm asking yeah. you. Um, to what extent does molecular taxonomy now have to be um, not overthrown, but at least thought of with, with great suspicion? Because you cannot tell which genes are in common because they're shared in a common ancestor or because they're cross-contaminated by a viral or bacterial transfer. Yeah. I mean, one of the exciting elements that people might find that are interested in the digital world here is we uh, can use the genetic code to watermark uh, chromosomes. So you can use it in a secret code or you can basically what we're using is the three letter, letter uh, a triplet code that codes for amino acids. There's 20 amino acids and they use uh, uh, single letters to denote those. So using the triplet code, we can write uh, words, sentences. We, we can say this uh, genome was made by Richard Dawkins uh, on this date in 2008. Uh, and I think that's going to be a key hallmark of, uh, of man-made uh, species, man-made chromosomes, is they will be very much uh, denoted that way. I mean, you could obviously copy something that was out there and make minor variations, uh, and nobody would necessarily know. But the other key tenet of what we're doing is the organisms that we're designing that other people are thinking of are designed not to survive outside of the lab, uh, outside of a, uh, of a production facility because they have very strict requirements for it. So I don't know anybody that's advocating making a new species and throwing it in the ocean to get better conversion uh, to put more oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, why don't we take oh, some... Yeah. Hello? Testing? Testing. Uh, I'm sure some of you have um, questions. I think you need to take my microphone. What? Uh. I have a question for Richard Durkins. My name is Ulrika Bartholofu from Focus Magazine. You've known Greg Venter for quite a while. You remember 10 years ago when the world was too slow for him sequencing the, geni the genome and he said I want to do it myself I don't want to do it quicker now he announces that he wants to create artificial life to resolve the energy crisis and bring the oil price down and create new forms of energy when will he come up with the first form of energy you're asking me a question about yes, Craig. To come and I asked him already a couple of weeks ago and he didn't say anything about the timeline. <laughs> so supposedly I told you in secret what the real answer was and you're, you're going to reveal it now. I, I'm not going to reveal anything. I, I, I mean, I, I want an answer from Craig about, about the kangaroos and the, I mean, I, I don't, but I think you're confusing two quite different things. I mean, they're, they're, of course, you can make viruses and bacteria transfer things and we know there are a few genes that have crossed contaminated from radically different parts of the animal and plant kingdoms. But I didn't know until you told me today, and I'm skeptical about it, that molecular taxonomy of, for example, mammals is endangered by cross-contamination of genomes. I don't believe molecular taxonomists yet, at least, say, oh, well, we can't use this gene uh, or to, to get our kangaroo taxonomy right because it's clearly been imported from a, from a rhinoceros. Yeah. So when we look at bacterial evolution, a typical bacteria will have 2,000 genes in it. Each one of those 2,000 genes has its own separate evolutionary tree that you can construct, and none of them have the same timeline that you could no, put that's together. Right, but that's bacteria. And, but that's bacteria. So viruses pick up bacterial genes all the time. They pick up mammalian genes all the time. A third of your genome is virus. It's not just you personally, it's all of us have that. Uh, and uh, th there are subtle differences in those that if a taxonomist was to measure viral genes unmistakably thinking it was a human gene, 
they would come up with a very different answer than one that was in the human lineage, perhaps from the beginning. You mentioned that you, there's 100 trillion uh, uh, cells in our body, so to speak. 100 trillion, right. Aren't most of them non-human? Aren't we really dependent on, uh, for our life, to have a lot of animal cells in our body? And in essence, are we not a human but a zoo? Well, it depends on what you had for breakfast. Um, so we have 100 trillion human cells we have at least that many bacterial cells associated with us. So, so we are it, a zoo. Well, we're, it depends. Uh, there's not too many bacterial zoos, but, but an important part of human metabolism, human diet, is you're not so much what you eat, as people say, you're what you feed the bacteria in your gut. So when we look at the chemicals in the blood after a meal, there's roughly 2,500 compounds that we as a species can make. Uh, we see roughly twice that many as bacterial metabolites in our guts from uh, what we feed them. So we live in a bacterial milieu. We breathe it, our guts, every orifice, our skin. We have more bacterial cells than we have human cells, and they are a very key part of our existence. We can't exist in a healthy life uh, without them. So that could be a zoo if you had a microscope. Um, oh, so, so, so I, I go ahead. My name is Robert Thielicke, Focus News Magazine. I have two questions, actually. Uh, one referring to Richard Dawkins' latest book, The God Delusion. And I would like to know from Venter how happy has he been about this book? Because, well, if there's no God, you, don't, you can't tinker with, with Genesis. So you don't have any ethical problems with that, maybe. The second one is, um, do you think that humankind is overtaking evolution? So, well, it, it will happen in the lab and not in a natural environment anymore. I think that was for you, Richard. Well, the, is this working? Yes. The first question seemed to be rather a strange question. It, it, it mentioned my book, uh, The God Delusion, Der Gotteswahn, and then said, what does what's Craig Venter's attitude to that because, and I didn't quite understand what the because was, it was something to do with he doesn't have to worry about Genesis anymore. I don't suppose he ever did worry about Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the assumption is we can't play God if there is no God. <laughs> All the more reason to do so, I should have thought. Uh, in response to Mr. Brockman's annual edge question, where uh, have people changed, where have you, for example, changed your minds? Where have the two of you changed your minds? And could you comment on Steven Pinker's response to that question? where uh, he stated that he once thought that humans were essentially not evolving anymore, uh, but now he believes that they are. Sorry, who, who said that humans... Steven Pinker. Right. Um, uh, the questioner points out that uh, John Brockman's Edge website uh, this year has the question, when have you changed your mind and why? and it ended up with the statement that Steven Pinker had changed his mind about whether humans had, uh, had, stopped, had stopped evolving. I answered the question about changing my mind, and I won't give my answer because it takes too long to explain. However, um, I will say that 